That's right. Well, first, I want to say, David, thank you so much for uh, having me. Um, it, the film was so incredibly powerful, and it left me thinking about the ways in which our humanity is bound up and tied up um, with one another. Uh, and as I think about uh, Reverend Lawson's legacy, I can't help but think about the Black church. Uh, when we think about this call and pursuit for justice, uh, this unquenchable thirst for equality and the recognition of humanity, um, that is what the Black church was born out of. All right, we're talking about an institution that began in the antebellum South, right, with enslaved communities gathering together in the hush harbors, uh, demanding recognition of their humanity and their community. But it's not solely coming from political institutions. It's not solely coming from uh, social networks or ties. It's ultimately rooted in one's connection to the divine, right? Who gives us all inherent worth and inherent dignity. Uh, so as I think about the struggles uh, that we are facing today, um, for me, it's really rooted in uh, the struggle of the Black church to accept um, LGBTQ folks. Uh, Reverend Lawson alluded to it. Um, it was brought up in the film as well. Um, what we see is that there's still today, right, a refusal to uh, impart the fundamental and constitutional rights um, that are afforded all citizens in the United States to LGBTQ folks, right? And what we are particularly seeing across this country is a slew of bills that are targeting um, Black trans folks, right? Um, but particularly trans children, right? The most vulnerable among us. So what we see is that this is an iterative process, right? Um, the struggles that we have are tied to the struggles that came before us. Uh, it's tied to um, our desire to advance humanity, um, not only for Black folks, right, for, but for Indigenous folks, not only for Indigenous folks, but for trans folks, right? What we're talking about are interlocking systems of oppression, right, that is so rooted in the way that we understand ourselves that we can't be free unless we are all free, because the systems that bind us right, the systems that constrain us, that oppress us, um, do so uh, to all marginalized identities, not just that of African Americans. So I'll, I'll say that, and I, I'd like to, you know, Melissa, invite you in here uh, and wonder how, how the film resonated with you, and uh, even as we think about the struggles of today, right, mm -hmm. what you see those struggles as being. Thank you, Don. I, I, I didn't want you to stop talking. I was enthralled. Um, and I just want to say amen to all that you share. Um, and as I, as I watched and listened with openness and receptivity, what when I took notes, what stood out for me most prominently uh, is that Reverend Lawson, like he embodies Sankofa, I believe wholeheartedly in the philosophy and the, and the ethic of Sankofa, the West African principle that in order to cast a vision forward, you have to make sure that you look back and learn from the past. And it's that the mystical bird that represents Sankofa, right? So it's a bird that's like moving forward while looking back. And here we have Reverend Lawson uh, embodying this because you heard from the children, the young people, that Reverend Lawson taught them strategies of love and nonviolence for today's contemporary movement and that parallels what I'm reading in John Lewis's memoir, where he talks about Reverend Lewis, Reverend Lawson teaching them, him and others uh, at a young age, the strategies of nonviolence and the strategy of love and saying, specifically Lewis says, that he, talked, he taught them that it was a way of life. It was not something that you turn off or on or something that you, you know, just pick up and put down. It's something that you carry inside you every day. So here you have this man who is, this teacher, this this this, this uh, wisdom holder, who was centuries, uh, decades ago, instilling these principles of love and nonviolence um, that have endured, 
and he continues to support contemporary work. So Sankofa and the enduring power of love and compassion, and like you said, Don, all of this work being rooted in the divine, that these are the principles and practices and resources that our ancestors clung to and utilized that have staying power that we have to make sure are infused within our current movements. And as one of the sisters said, you know, she, she, she talked about how love and forgiveness um, had to be embedded within their labor movement organizing, so into policy. So really thinking critically about the importance of love and compassion and forgiveness, relationship building as critical elements of this movement work which will help us get to, like Lawson said at the end, achieving the full status of our humanity. Um, and we can't, no matter what we do, no matter what the issue is, we can't, um, we can't get past that. We can't, we can't move away from that, those fundamental principles. Yeah, and so, you know, and I, I do, um, you know, I appreciate that. I, I, and I, you know, and Don, and I, I, um, I, you know, I'm so I'm so um, moved by 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 the the kind of uh, uh, full engagement in the world that Reverend Lawson epitomized, right? So, um, you know, and you know, from that very early age, and that that story he told about about uh, Martin King, you know, uh, saying we need you now. Right, uh, and you know that you know in some ways you know that is the that is the call of uh, uh, to the black pastor, right? Um, uh, and there's a, a a call for direct engagement, and 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 I wonder you know if you all talk to that a little bit about about kind of how that how we see that both historically and and going forward, you know this. This, this kind of this notion of a call to action, both for the for the for the for the leader and for the congregation. In so many ways, I think the best way to answer that is uh, from the space of a truth that I think we all know, and that is the personal is political. Right. Uh, when we embody the totality of our identities and we enter into the public square. Uh, the way that we embody those identities impact the way that others see us, view us, and treat us, mm -hmm. right? So for Reverend Lawson, right, who subscribes to the Christian love ethic, right, this belief that you should treat others as you yourself want to be treated, right, this love ethic where God commands us, calls us to do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly, Right, that has implications not just for my own personal salvation, right? It has implications for how I perceive and treat the other, right? But also how I stand in solidarity with the other. Uh, and again, there is a historical context here, right? When I say the person was political, that is a history that is deeply rooted within the Black church, within the Black religious tradition. It was shaped and fashioned under, right, chattel slavery. It was shaped and fashioned under the active and persistent and ongoing dehumanization of Black people. Right, so when we decided to create an institution that affirmed us, we were not only resisting a white God who endorsed our oppression, we were, into, we were also pushing back against combating systems and institutions, institutions that sought to strip us of fundamental rights. Mm. Right. So when we understand the historical context of Reverend Lawson's activism, we have to root it back to the very foundations and formations of the Black church, which was not just a personal fight for freedom and liberation, but a collective fight for freedom and liberation. And what we've seen historically is that the Black church has acted as the moral conscience of this country. It has pushed us and prodded us and pricked our conscience to move toward a more just and free and liberated world. So when I think about the preacher, David, what comes to mind for me is that we don't, it seems to me, right, have a plethora of prophets. We have a lot of preachers, 
but we don't have a lot of profits. Those who are willing and able to critique systems of power, all right? And I think that's really what we need to what we need to be critiquing, what we need to be lifting up in this moment, and when we think about the role of the Black church, or for that matter, any worldview or religious tradition, right? How are we leveraging and harnessing the gifts, the spiritual genius of those traditions to critique systems of power? After all, that is what James Lawson did when he decided to move down to Nashville, Tennessee to fight, but also when he moved to Los Angeles and decided to engage in labor organizing. There is a through line here, and that is a critique of systems that dehumanize and oppress people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, uh, and Melissa, do you have thoughts? I mean, I, I do want to kind of just call out this prophetic tradition. I mean, I think it's really uh, uh, central and, and, and we, ha you know, we, we cannot lose track of it. Um, it's, a, it's a path that has been, been been traveled and and you know it might be a little overgrown right now but but we we, we definitely need that path but Melissa I, I'd be curious to hear hear from you on this as well I, I do again I just say amen to everything that uh Reverend Don just just prophetically uttered um and the the call today for the preacher today uh you, Reverend Lawson at the beginning of the film I was a little distracted so I don't remember the quote but he made, he talked about mass incarceration I remember the quote that he said, but the preacher today has to be on the front line regarding the fight to dismantle mass incarceration. And that's something that we're not engaging with enough uh, in the Black community, in the Black church. We're not talking about it enough. We're not organizing around it. We're not mobilizing around it. And then the other, you know, very significant movement is what Don so beautifully discussed, and that's the LGBTQ struggle. Um, so these are, these are, these are, pressing needs and struggles that we, that require prophetic um, voices and voices who are committed to action and who understand the multiple dimensions of the humanity uh, that, that Black people possess. And if, uh, you know, the people that, that Lawson helped to train or who worked alongside Lawson years ago, like the Kings, like the Ella Bakers, like the Fannie Lou Hamers, I mean, they would be on the front line for, uh, in these struggles today. So um, that's what we're being called to. That's what the Black church is being called to. And I think we're being called as Black people uh, to even move beyond what church, traditional church looks like um, to help uh, expand the notion and understanding of church to re-engage people who are not coming. So that's part of the work, work of reimagining uh, right now requires that we uh, figure out how to do church differently, figure out how to, to language and voice the message of love and justice and freedom uh, differently in a way that reaches uh, the masses currently. Yeah. Um, so, 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 Don. I mean, I want to. I want to ask you to, if you will, talk a little about the work that you're doing and the project that that you that you that you have launched. I mean, and I mean, I think. Um, Again, I want you know. I, I do want to underscore. It. It's not just. It's not just loss. And then this clearly was. You know, I, I mean, John. I mean, and you know, mentioned John Lewis. You know, uh, and and uh, in terms of a prophetic voice who who actually put his body on the line, but but he embodied that Houston notion that all our struggles tied in together. He, you know, and and you know, we we get it from King too. You know, this idea that. You know that you know as long as you know we, we none of us if, if any of us is is not free none of us is free, and and um, you know and I th and I think interestingly you know I'll, I'll put I, I want to put it this way Don. I mean I think that the challenge that 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 you're face that you're asking the, the church and, and all of us to confront. Uh, it is the challenge of a real fidelity to our faith, right? And and really living the faith. So so can you talk a little bit about the project that you're undertaking and, and kind of what you're what you're trying to do uh, with uh, Pride in the Pew? I, I'd be happy to. So I I I'll root it in this notion that often, right, and historically, uh, Christianity has been co-opted. Uh, in service of white supremacy uh, and oppressive ideologies, 
right? It has been used uh, to endorse and to legitimize in structural and institutional violence. Uh, and the Black church has done a really phenomenal job. I'm a child of the Black church, born and raised, still preaching it today. It's done a phenomenal job at calling out in very pointed and intentional ways, racism. Right. And more than we have historically, we've done a better job at empowering women, right, recognizing that they, too, have been called right to preach and to prophesy and to pray. Uh, but what we perpetually fail to do uh, is extend that measure of humanity and divinity to LGBTQ folks, broadly speaking. Um, we have allowed um, our theology, once again, to be co-opted by homophobic and transphobic forces uh, that, uh, in so many ways, endorse dehumanization. So for me, as a child of the Black church, as someone who sees myself deeply wedded to the Black religious tradition of freedom and liberation, there's no way I can stand on the sacred uh, sort of ground of the Black church without fighting for LGBTQ rights. And it, it's with this recognition that I created Pride in the Pews. Uh, it's a grassroots campaign celebrating queer voices in the Black church. It is an intentional effort to lift up the stories and the voices and the strug struggle of queer folks um, in an effort to not only change culture and to change society, but also to change hearts and minds. Uh, and the way that I'm doing that, the way that the folks who are working with me is doing that is through storytelling. Um, after all, um, if you know a Black preacher, uh, if you know the Black church, um, we know how to tell a good story. Uh, and it is through the story of our faith, the story of my calling, that I created Pride in the Pews. And this is where I shamelessly uh, will encourage everyone listening uh, to uh, uh, go ahead and follow us on social media, Facebook and Instagram uh, at Pride in the Pews, uh, and even visit our website, uh, prideinthepews.com and plug in, give, uh, support, amplify uh, as best you can. Because as I said, our struggles are interconnected with one another. Um, this is my lot in life. I've been called to advance LGBTQ rights, um, but I exist alongside folks who are fighting in the labor rights movement. I exist alongside folks who are fighting for women's rights. I exist around folks who are fighting for their sacred lands. I do this in relationship, in concert with, in conversation with all those who have been oppressed. Um, and considering the hegemonic Christianity that still exists in this country, we are all doing the work of dismantling uh, that Christian supremacy. Man can preach, can't he? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but Melissa, you know, so can you, I know that. So, uh, you know, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I, I want to touch on something that, that Don mentioned that I know, uh, you, you know, you, you, you are familiar and proficient with and, 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 and have you talk, talk a little bit, you know, you mentioned this idea of finding new ways to, 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 to celebrate our, you know, our, our faith or whatever. I mean, you didn't say it that way exactly, but, you know, new challenges for the church. But I, I also know that you are very aware and familiar of the power of storytelling and the need to uh, recover the stories and and uh, you know and and and, and that, that that has those are pathways to our to finding our own spirituality right and and and, and experiencing it and so you know I, 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 i'd like you to talk a little bit about about the importance of storytelling and and, and its role um, in 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 creating restoring and maintaining our faith yeah, thank you, David. It's a beautiful question. Uh, truly, I, I immediately think about my grandfather who passed away almost a year ago at the age of 99, Reverend Marcus Garvey Wood. And I mean, I was born and raised in the church and uh, I sat under him Sunday after Sunday. He was a uh, classmate of Dr. King's at Crozier Theological Seminary. He's one of my earliest teachers of justice and faith and love. And I'm blessed that, my family's blessed that he, not only was a gifted preacher, but a gifted teacher, and he chronicled his story in a book about his life, uh, the first 50 years of ministry. And 
you know, one of the, there, all the stories are powerful, but what's so precious and powerful to me is, uh, are the stories that he, where he talks about his grandmother who was enslaved and his grandfather who was enslaved and how they passed faith down to him. And he specifically talks about uh, growing up in, in Wernick, Virginia and his grandmother, Susan, who was formerly enslaved and she would sit on the porch uh, rocking back and forth on her, in, in her rocker, singing songs about Jesus and love, songs of Zion and about how much she loved Jesus. And my grandfather was five years old at the time. At this point, Moses had passed on uh, her husband. She would talk about how much she loved Jesus and how much she loved her husband, Moses. And he writes in his book that it was through her singing, through her songs, through her teachings, that's when he began to understand the love of God. Um, what makes that the, 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 he says the love that makes the world go round and round. So, so I have this image of him, and I hold onto the story of him learning at the at the feet of his grandmother's uh, at his grandmother's knees, and how this generational faith is passed down. And to me, it's always been striking uh, as a person who is descended of Africans who enslaved in this country. He was my like my connection, my portal, because he was just a generation of, you know, removed. And when we think about the capacity of, of Black people who were enslaved to continue to hold on to love, not only love of God, but love of each other and love of one another, um, those stories keep me going. So whenever I think about what's happening today, as hard and as harsh as this world is, all I have to do is recall those stories and recall uh, the notion of a woman, you know, like Susan Wood, who I now have a picture of, who was enslaved, you know, the majority of her life, um, meaning she was owned by somebody else, but still through her connection to the divine, maintained the capacity to transcend that oppression and love God, love herself, love her husband, and love her children and her children's children. And because of that love, I'm still here. So if it was not for the stories, the stories, the contemporary stories that bring the ancient texts to life, the stories of love and forgiveness. This isn't theoretical for me, but I'm talking about forgiveness and love. It's generational, it's in my DNA. And so the stories keep this alive. Mm -hmm. yeah, see, that's, yeah. <laughs> see, you know, thank you. I mean, I know, I know, I mean, I've heard, you know, and, it, and, it, and it's true, you know, and I, and, and I, I, I have to, uh, I'm gonna use a prerogative here. And, you know, you know we here at this institution, face a, a challenge just like this. Uh, and that challenge has to do with the daguerreotypes of Papa Renti. Uh, and, you know, if any of you have ever heard uh, Tammy Lanier talk about Papa Renti, she, she, she talks about how the, how the stories have been passed down to her over time about this ancestor named Brenti. Uh, and, and when she talks about kind of her legitimate claim to those daguerreotypes, you know, it's, the sto <laughs> it's, it's that story that she relies upon. She, you know, because it, it, it is a truth, right? And uh, it's, a, it's a lived truth that has been handed down that is greater than the law, you see? And, and this is what, you know, so, so, and what's interesting, of course, is that we have an institution here that chooses to rely upon the law uh, to defend itself against the truth. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's, it, it, you know, and, and it's, it's, it is a way in which um, the, the words and example of loss and, and, you know, and again, I think one of the things about the film that, that that struck me, and of course it would be true, uh, was, you know, that he was in India. <laughs> this is not book learning, right? <laughs> you know, and and uh, it, you know, it was it was lived experience that he brought to this. Um, so so, you know, I, I I don't know how to, you know, how to think about. Kind of pointing us forward, and and so you know, I, I you know, I, I'm curious to, for, for both of you to to think about. You know, Don, I think there's some sense of in what you're talking about of 
uh, you know, the, of the project. Um, but but give us a little sense of, of what a future could look like, right? If you know what 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 could our future look like if we follow the the love and solidarity exemplified by Lawson and 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 kind of find a way forward that's true to these the, to the ancestors and these stories. What what you know? I know King, Dr. King spoke of the beloved community, and interestingly, you know, he never really specified <laughs> what it was. It was aspirational. We all have to kind of and 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 Reverend Lawson mentioned it too. You know, is is that is that a future we can we can envision? And if so, what does it look like? How, what does it feel like? Well, I mean, to to answer that question pointedly, when you asked if it's a future that um, I think there are two questions, right? Is it a future that we can envision, right? And is it a future that we can actually capture, achieve, right? That we can realize. Um, and in that sense, I am uh, standing alongside my ancestors, um, where they didn't necessarily know, <laughs> right? But there was this hunger, there was this insatiable um, call and desire to keep on pressing on, mm -hmm. right? So. I don't know if we will get there, right? But what I know is we've been called to never stop trying to get there, right? And this is where I actually think of King's words, where uh, King calls us to be creative extremists, right? In the way that we imagine and envision another world. But for me on a very practical level, right? Because I think you can be lofty with this, right? I think you can be theoretical with this, but on a very, very practical level, I just think about Jesus, mm -hmm. right? I think about the embodied example of principles, all right? And David, when you so aptly pointed out this sort of tension between, between truth and law, I couldn't help but think about the embodiment of Jesus, right? Who quite literally refuted the law right? Antiquated notions and ideas that did not grant people their humanity, right. right? And when they encountered Jesus, someone who was in community radically, someone who was in fact um, fighting for, advocating for, and check this out, centering the voices of those on the margins, they had no idea what to do with them, right? So I think that's exactly what we've been called to do, center, advocate for and fight on behalf of those who are on the margins. And Jesus had a very simple, and I'm a Baptist preacher, so you know that's my example, right? Jesus is a very apt example in this regard, right? Whether it's the Black preacher, whether it's you who's on the Zoom, what we see Jesus do immediately before Jesus starts to preach, before Jesus starts to prophesy in the New Testament, what you, start, what you see Jesus do is meet immediate material needs, period. That's what Jesus did, right? Before he preached, before he prophesied, he made sure folks had food to eat, right? The old Baptist preacher would say he had some crackers and sardines and he fed 5,000, right? So I think when we think about our role and our calling in this world, it's a matter of making sure the material needs of everyone is met, ensuring that everyone has physical safety, ensuring that no one um, is terrorized with impunity ensuring that no one is locked up and the key is thrown away without accountability and, tr and true justice. So for me, very practically, I think it's rooted in standing with those who are, who are hungry, standing with those who are incarcerated, standing with those who are brokenhearted, right, by a system that refused to acknowledge them. I think that's the path forward. Thank you, Donna. I agree wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly. And, and, you know, Don, what you said about, you know, we don't know, we don't, ha we won't, we don't know if we'll get there. It's just, it's, and, and the need to press on and, and keep moving in spite of, and that's what our ancestors did. Our ancestors, our enslaved ancestors had no idea that we would be sitting right here. My enslaved ancestor, Grandmother Susan, had no idea of what it would look like, but held on to the vision that a way is going to be made um, and some at some point down the line, and, and they, so we had the responsibility to do what they did, which is to hold true, you know, hold hold fast to our faith um, through love and through forgiveness um, to keep the vision, because we don't know the end, but we hold on to the vision and to the knowing that an end will come. The vision, the bluff community, 
uh, will be realized whether we make it or not, we have to stay committed to advancing the work. And I was trying to find, Lawson mentioned something about the need to dismantle violence, like policies that, that you know, violence and to you know, cultivate policy. So when this tension between the, the law and the love, we gotta, we gotta reconcile that. Like and then, you know, we're talking, to, you know, this is sponsored by Harvard Law School. So we, the part of the work that I understand it to be is like changing, transforming the people who are going out into the world to have the capacity to make laws and policies so that the laws and policies that are cultivated are, are rooted in love and rooted in compassion. Um, and so that's critical to the work, but standing firm and holding on to the vision, rooted in faith, rooted in love, that is the work of our ancestors. And we have a responsibility because if we can't do it in the midst of all of our luxury of comfort, and they did it when they were enslaved and owned by other people, shame on us. So it's so important to be rooted in our history and the story of the struggle to remind us of our contemporary responsibility. Well, thank you all. I mean, <laughs> um, so I, you know, again, I, you know, I, I, I don't know how it is that I'm in this position because I don't, I don't like to be in this position, you know, <laughs> um, you know, except that it allows me to be close to, to folks like you. And, um, uh, you know, I do want to, so I, I think, you know, I want to, if people are up for it and, and they maybe have a, a couple of questions, you know, I, I'd like to allow people to ask those questions. Before I do that, though, I do want to, there goes the dog. Um, you know, I, I, I do want to, you know, Kaya corrected uh, Melissa's actual title, uh, you know, in, in the chat. And, you know, I realized that I had jumped the gun and, and, and called her professor. And that's because uh, uh, last week uh, she, she, she defended her dissertation and, 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 and became, in my, became a doctor. So, so now, she, now she'd be a doctor, right? <laughs> and uh, so from, from, as far as I'm concerned, you know, so, and, and, I, and I will say this, you know, she, she's laughing and smiling about it, but you talk about keeping her eye on the prize, right? I mean, this has been a, a journey and, and, and I have seen it and, and, uh, and, and, it's, and it is to be celebrated and appreciated. And so I want to uh, I want to call that out, and I don't want to embarrass you, but I, I do want to, to to shout it out. So, uh, do do people have questions? I'm gonna. Uh, so maybe we could switch this view back, Coco. Um, you know, and, and if not, I can understand that, and we can, uh, uh, you know, we can call it a wrap. I, I encourage. Uh, you know, as, as always, you know, I encourage all of us to, uh, to carry this with us, you know, um, and, uh, and to, you know, recommend this film to others, right? I mean, I think uh, one of the, the biggest uh, 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 tasks before us is getting the word out. And, and, and I think this, this is an important film that, that we can and should be sharing with others. Um, so if there aren't any questions, and Don and Melissa, I don't know how you top what you've already said, but if you wanted to have some last words, you know, we would welcome them. Well, I just want to extend my gratitude to both you and Melissa. I mean, I'm on a panel with two doctors. So, <laughs> you know, I, I have a long way to go. Oh, uh, come on, man. Come on, man. You, you, you got it. You, you know, you, you have, you have, you have the doctor. You, you are a doctor of my soul. You, you soothe my soul. You ease my pain. You know, you, know, you got, the, you got my medicine, man. <laughs> but I just, I, I'm so appreciative of this conversation, and uh, for you, Melissa, your insights and the work that you're doing, um, I leave encouraged and heartened um, because. It, I'm in conversation with colleagues in the struggle, right? Um, and the only thing I would end on, and that is this, um, one of my favorite scriptures uh, is, in the, is in the book of Proverbs, uh, chapter 29, verse 18. Uh, and it says, where there is no vision, uh, the people perish. Mm -hmm. So our job, our role is to name 
the vision, mm -hmm. ultimately, ultimately pursue the realization of that vision. Again, thank you, David, and thank you, Melissa. Okay. Melissa? I just echo gratitude to David um, for your partnership over the years. You, I just appreciate you so much and to the organizers of this conversation and to Don. Dr. Don, I mean, yes, there you go. Wait, please. I mean, it's been an, an honor and a privilege to be in conversation with you. And I just want to appreciate you for your work, your prophetic ministry, pr pride in the pews. I'm going to follow you. Um, you are casting the vision and the vision that we need to not only keep our eyes on, but all of us need to embody and to, to work earnestly to fulfill. So I just thank you for your work. Um, and I thank you all for being here and for your attention. And we just continue, if we continue to stay rooted and grounded in love, um, as Reverend Lawson has taught, uh, the enduring power of love will see us to the end. Thank you. Amen. All right. So with that, Coco and Sarah, I thank you all, you both tremendously. And, uh, and I guess we wish everyone a, a good evening. Thank you all.